Buenos días, movimiento. It's so good to uh, be with you this morning. Um, that language I just spoke, if you don't know what that was, that was Espanol. Uh, we'll be speaking more of it because uh, if you haven't been to the building, we're nestled right in the middle of a Hispanic Latino neighborhood. Y ellos hablan Espanol. And so if you don't know the language, you're going to need to learn it soon. But uh, I am excited to be here uh, to open up the word and, and talk about what, what God has to teach us this morning. But before I do, uh, let me just give you uh, a reminder. September 6th, um, here at the building, live, face to face, we're going to be uh, starting our reopening and it's for friends and family. And so if you haven't already, go ahead and sign up at the, uh, www.movecc.org. And then September 13th, five five years we're going to be celebrating and so uh, sign up there as well because we're going to be together we're going to celebrate what God has done how he has just been blessing us even in the midst of this pandemic we will see each other face to face physically distanced as my wife likes to say not socially distanced we're going to still talk we're going to still connect but we're going to be together and we're going to celebrate uh, together so we're excited um, I've got some bad news for some of you. If you are a student, summer is almost over. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you didn't already know, I'm a school teacher, so I, I start tomorrow and we, we get this thing rolling. Uh, we'll see what, what it looks like with online schooling, but here it comes. So in honor of school coming back, I'm going to give you a two question quiz. Just two questions. If you're a member of the movement, you should know these answers like this. And if you don't, I think Dee's going to help you out. The first question is, what is the vision of the movement? What is the vision of the movement? I'll give you a second to think or cheat. All right. Do you know? The, que the vision of the movement is we are a church that is distinctively different, self-sacrificing disciples of Christ, growing in relationship with God and with one another. Did you know that? That's what we desire to be here at the movement. And the word disciples is an important word that we're going to unpack today because a disciple is somebody who is a student of, of Jesus, somebody who has been given a new identity because he's put his faith in what Jesus has done for him. And so we want to be disciples of Christ doing what? Growing. So when we put our faith in Jesus, we've, we've got to be growing. So I found this little quote uh, in this little book called Basic Christianity by John Stott. And it says, the great privilege of the child of God is relationship. His great responsibility is growth. Everybody loves children, but nobody in his right mind wants them to stay in the nursery. The tragedy, however, is that many Christians, born again in Christ, never grow up. Others even suffer from spiritual infantile reg regression. Our Heavenly Father's purpose, on the other hand, is that babes in Christ should become mature in Christ. Our birth must be followed by growth. The crisis of justification, our acceptance before God, must lead to the process of sanctification, our growth in holiness. That's our responsibility. So if we are disciples of Christ, then we should be growing in relationship with God and with one another because we're, we're invited into this family. Question number two, what is the mission of the movement give you a second to think that's correct stacy the movement church exists exists to leverage who we are in christ to change the world around us so who we want to be are these distinctively different self-sacrificing disciples of christ how do we do that we leverage who we are in christ and so like i said when we put our faith in jesus we become a new creation that's what uh Corinthians tells us, Galatians 2.20 tells us, uh, it is no, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have a new identity. I become a new person. I'm not the same person I was before. If, you, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you knew what you were like before you were a Christian, and now you, you look at your life now, and there should be a difference. And if there's not a difference, then there's some, some conversations that you need to have with God. Uh, another one in Corinthians is that you're not your own. And so that's what we're going to see with this word leverage. The, the, this passage that we're looking at in Matthew, uh, starting at 24, 36, and ending all the way to the end of chapter 25, which we're going to look at in a moment, is 
how we leverage who we are in Christ, how we can start to change the world around us because we understand our identity. And our identity, I'm going to tell you the point now, is to be a steward. And that's an old-time Bible word. It just means a manager. So you come to the realization that you're not an owner of anything once you become a, uh, a Christian, but you're a manager of everything that he gives you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to open up your word and to share it with, um, with family and with friends. And I pray, God, that you just open up our eyes to help us to see what you want to communicate, that you would change our hearts, that we wouldn't be the same uh, after this morning, uh, looking into your word. Holy Spirit, just help us to understand. And then I pray, God, that we would have put it into practice in our life, that we would be good stewards, managers of what you've given us. Help us to see that clearly in your word. We pray in your name. Amen. So looking at Matthew 25, go ahead uh, and open it up. Actually, Matthew 24, verse 36 is where we're going to be at. Go ahead and take a look. Um, I'm not going to read it all because if you look at these, uh, these two sections, it's large. And so we're going to just going to go from section to section, kind of highlight, highlighting some things. But like I said, we're going to unpack this word leverage. We're going, to, we're going to try to understand what it means within the context of this particular text. And so just to give you a review for those of us that are kind of just jumping in right now, We've been in the book of Matthew, and we've learned that Jesus is king. Jesus is king. He's king of everything. He came, but he's a, when he came, he came not like most kings. Most kings would come in triumphantly with a loud procession, uh, a huge announcement. The whole world would know. But if, if you remember, when we celebrate Christmas, he was born in a manger, which shows that he was a humble king. He's a lowly king. And he was a king like no other because he surrounds himself with people that most kings wouldn't surround themselves with. The least and the lost, the marginalized and the oppressed. He never surrounded himself with the powerful, with the rich, the ones that were influencers. No, he, he surrounded himself with those that were less than. And so we see that he's this unique king that was prophesied in the Old Testament and who has shown up on the scene and has flipped the world upside down because of the way that he moves and acts and treats people. He speaks to women with respect and dignity. He breaks barriers and talks to people that were of a different, different ethnicity. Um, he, he was unlike any other king. And what, what's most amazing is that he surrounds himself with the second string team instead of the first string. He surrounds himself with these, these disciples who were in essence losers. They had their chance to be a part of uh, the, the priesthood and learn the Torah and all the things that they were supposed to learn. They didn't get it, and that's why they were fishermen. And so Jesus selects the ones that weren't the best, but he uses that, that, uh, that, that relationship with them to change their worlds. He's king because he had authority, authority over the natural. He, he spoke to the wind and it obeyed him. He healed sicknesses and diseases. He had authority over the physical. He had authority over the spiritual. He was exercising demons with just a word. This is a king like no other. And that's what we're looking at right now. He's having a conversation with these disciples, and they have questions, just like we have questions. Because he, Jesus has just kind of explained uh, what's, what's going to happen at the ends of the age. And they're like, when is this going to happen, Jesus? And he goes to explaining, and it's chapter 24 and chapter 25, that is his answer. And so we're, we're going to look at that right now. One more thing to remember, when you read the Bible, you have to remember that it was written to Jews. So Matthew, the author of this book, was a Jew culturally who was a believer in Jesus who was a Jew. So when you read these stories, remember that context. And so storytelling was extremely important in, in Jewish teaching. So here in America, we give you the point, and then we use stories to kind of support it. Well, in Jewish thinking, it's the other way around. The story is where you get the, where the, you get the information. But what they do is they'll tell a story, and then tell a story, and then tell a story, and then right in the middle, kind of talking around that point, you'll find it. And so you've got to pay attention to that. Also, uh, when, you, when you think about Jewish thinking, in America, we think about me, I. But in Jewish thinking, they think about the we. 
It's individual versus collective. And so as you read this, think to yourself as a Jew would, understand it the way they did so that you can understand it the way you're supposed to. All right, so let's take a look at the first section uh, talking about um, verse 36 when he's asked the question, when is the end of the age of Jesus? Look at Jesus' answer. So 24 verse 3 is where they ask the question. It says, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of our coming and the end of the age? And so his answer is in verse 36 for the first part of the question. When is the end of the age? Verse 36, read it with me. It says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. So the disciples are like, okay, when is this happening? And Jesus is like, no sé, un poco ne, I don't know. But who does? God the Father does. So he answers that first question, and now he's going to answer the next part of the question. What is the sign of the end of the age? And so in that little section, you see a a story, the sign of Noah, and then two therefores. And that's what I want you to pay attention to. So the sign of Noah was um, before the days of the flood, looking at verse 36, I'm sorry, 38, for in the, the, as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Unaware. They weren't ready. They weren't prepared. They weren't watching. It caught them off guard. Right? And so what is Jesus' point here? Look at the two therefores. Starting at? Verse 42, 42, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what, do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Stay awake, be watchful. The the next therefore is verse 44. Therefore, you must also, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So you've got to be awake, watchful and you've got to be ready, prepared. Put those two, t- two ideas together and what you are is, as a, someone who's supposed to be leveraging, leveraging who you are in Christ, you need to be expectant. Now, if you live in South Florida like I do, you, you know about expectant because you're out on a picnic, beautiful day, and I promise you in less than five seconds, now you've got great clouds. And what are you expecting? You're expecting lightning. And so you are watching because you know that those gray clouds mean something, but then you're also waiting, so you go into a safe place to avoid the lightning that can come at any moment. You know it's coming, you just don't know when. So you're watching and you're waiting, you're expectant. And so if you are a Christian who has put their faith in in Christ and what he's done on the cross, then you are expecting, you are waiting for Jesus to return. When? I mean, based on 2020, it could be the day after tomorrow. But at some point, we know he's coming. Now, lots of theologians have debates. Uh, uh, is he coming before the rapture, after, after the rapture, before the tribulation, after the... T- I don't know. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Jesus is coming. Amen? He's coming again. And so the question is, what do you do in the meantime? You're being expectant. You're, we- you're watching and you're waiting. But what are you doing in the meantime? Well, Jesus is an excellent teacher. He gives us the answers by giving us three more stories. Verse 43 talks about the thief in the night. Let me read it for you. But, if, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what, in what part of the night the, night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, be ready. I imagine... Never in your life would you have someone knock at your door, you open the door, and there standing there is a person all dressed in black. Hi, I'm going to be your thief tonight. I'll be, the ho- I'll be by at 10. Uh, I expect you to be asleep. If that were the case, you would be standing ready with a shotgun for Mr. Thief because you don't want your house to be robbed. We have, we have had our house broken into 
it's very disconcerting, it's very unsettling, because you, you didn't know when they were coming. So the kids were in school, and I was at work, Stacy was at work, and they stole our TV. That's pretty much it, they broke the, the window. I was more upset about the window than the TV, but the point is they came in when I wasn't ready, right? Everything was locked up, but they broke through the window, there was nothing I could do about it. But had I been there at such and such a time, let's say it was at two o'clock, then it more than likely wouldn't have been happening, right? That's what Jesus is trying to say. Be expected, be ready, because I'm coming. And you need to start paying attention to what's going on. Because with the sign of Noah, the people missed it. Why? Because they were just living their lives on their, their own terms. They, they thought they were owners of their lives rather than managers. They weren't leveraging who they were. They were just living for themselves. And they missed it. They were shut out. Look at the next story. This is a, a powerful story starting in chapter 25. I'm sorry, I skipped one. Uh, ver- chapter 24, verse 45. We know that Jesus is coming again, so what will you be doing when he, when he returns? What will you be doing? Are you going to be a good, faithful steward, a manager, understanding that you're not the owner of anything, but the manager of everything that God has put in your hands? Look at the story. It says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant? I would underline that because there's the key. Whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at their proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, to himself, my master is delayed and begins to hear, I'm sorry, beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with the, and with, eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him to pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What will you be doing in the meantime? We're waiting expectantly. We're watching. We're, We're looking and paying attention to the signs. But in that meantime... What are you doing? Are you leveraging who you are in Christ to see change around you in your community, in your workplace, in your home? Or are you living for yourself because you believe you're the owner of everything and you can do as you please? There's your warning. A good steward understands that he is a manager. She is a manager of what God has placed in their life. Do not assume that you have your own rights and your own rules. If you are a Christian, you let it all go. The Bible tells us that if we're to be Christians, we're supposed to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Deny myself means I need to die, die daily. Is that Lecrae? I think that's, no? Who is that? Dylan Chase. I have to die daily. That means I have to choose to put things that I want out of the way so that I can do what my master calls me to. And I think that's where the church has struggled, has even failed in some places, where we know what's supposed to be done and we decide to do something else. And what's sad is the church is known for being hypocrites, saying one thing and doing the other. And so the question that Jesus poses to us is, we know I'm coming back. What will I see you doing when I return? Will you be that faithful steward, managing the the affairs of the king, your your master, in a way that gives him honor? Or will you live for yourself, doing things that you will pay for? The third story just amplifies what he's trying to say. So what things can we leverage while we're waiting expectantly for our king? The parable of the ten virgins. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for you. I encourage you to read it. It starts at chapter 25, starting at verse 1, all the way through 13. There are ten bridesmaids, ten virgins. Five are foolish, five are wise. If you were a bridesmaid back in Jewish times, one of your responsibilities was to have your torch ready to be burning when the bridegroom would be uh, announced so that he could see his way to his bride, right? It's a, it's a beautiful picture because that's really what God has done for us. In, Amer- excuse me, in America, when you get uh, married, 
they don't have the whole walking down the aisle part at all. They have three parts, the contract, consummation, and then celebration, right? So the contract is where the, the groom will go to the dad, sign saying that I'm going to betroth your daughter, I'm going to take care of her, I will be responsible for her. Joseph and Mary were betrothed, if you remember from way back early in Matthew. Right? They were legally married, but they had not consummated the marriage. What does that mean? They haven't had sex yet. Right? In a Jewish wedding, the groom would leave his uh, legal wife, who has, who has not consummated the relationship with, at her home, and he would go to his father's house and add an addition to prepare a place for his bride. That should sound familiar to you, if you remember John 14, I go to, a, to prepare a place. I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back for you. Check it out, John 14. That's the picture here, right? And so he is building a place for his wife. The father tells the groom when he can go and get the, the bride, right? Don't know when it's going to happen. If you are a bridesmaid, you have to be expectant, watching and waiting. And we see that the foolish bridesmaids, the foolish virgins, did not bring enough oil. And so the bridegroom is announced, he's coming, and they were left with no oil. And so they asked the wise ones who had prepared, who had leveraged who they were, I'm a bridesmaid, I should be prepared, I should be expectant. I should manage my time, that's something that we can leverage as believers, for this responsibility. And so they told those foolish ones, you know what, go back to the store and buy some. Well, when they were gone, guess who showed up? The bridegroom. And they entered in, celebrated, that's the last part, uh, after the consummation. And I won't even tell you about that one, that's kind of weird. Um, they celebrate, and then those five foolish versions were shut out. What can you leverage as a believer? You can leverage your time. These five foolish bridesmaids probably thought, this is probably like a Cuban wedding, so I've got more than enough time. He'll be late. I can do what i got to do. No. He showed up when they were not prepared. Are you starting to hear that echo of the previous story? We are, as believers, to leverage who we are, to, to use to our maximum advantage as believers whatever God has put in our hands, whatever God has placed in our lives, to point back to him. Because he's the king. Everything is his. And we need to live our lives in a way that exemplifies that. The parable of the talents is also a, another story to make the same point, And it just keeps amplifying this idea that you can leverage not just your time, but your talent and your treasure. The word talent back then was a monetary value about a little over $1,000. Probably where we get the word talent today, right? And I'm going to retell that one as well because it's rather long. But you've got uh, a master who calls his servants and he gives one servant five talents, gives another servant two talents, and the third servant one talent. He says, I've got to go on a trip. I want you to work, make this work for me. Make that money work. And so he returns and he talks to the, the dude with the five talents and says, hey, what you got for me? Master, I got five more talents for you. Here you go. The, the, the one with two. Uh, I, I, I doubled it. Now you've got twice as much. Now you've got four. And then he has a conversation with the one with the one talent. Master, I knew you to be a hard man and you reap where you did not sow. And so... What I did was I, I buried it in the field. But here you go. Now, here's what I want you to notice. The master was not upset with the one that had two talents because he, he didn't get five. They all received something. They all had something to leverage, right? What his master was pleased with was his faithfulness, his willingness to take a risk to understand, I want you to make this work. I want you to use this to maximum advantage. And if you look at it, the dude who had five came back with 100% return. I wish I could make my money do that. 
The one with two did the same thing. And the master was pleased. As a matter of fact, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. When we are faithful, the reward is joy and a celebration from the master. Isn't that what we want to hear from God when he returns? Well done, good and faithful servant. It's not about us. It's not our stuff. It's his stuff. He's the king. He asks us to manage it, steward it, use it, leverage it to have an impact. And all too often we think that this stuff is ours. It's my car. It's my house. It's my life. And church, I'm telling you, you're wrong. That's why the church is known for its hypocrisy. Because we don't understand scripture. We don't understand what it is clearly communicating to us. There is a king and it's his stuff. It's not yours. What can you leverage to give him the glory? So no one complained. Everybody was content with what they have. But I want to look at this uh, one, the one that did nothing. Why, why didn't he do anything with it? Because he was afraid. He was fearful. He thought, I can do whatever I want. I don't trust this guy, so I'm going to just hide it. Do nothing with it. Not leverage it. And look at the reaction of the master. Verse 26 in chapter 25, it says, But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. Take that talent from him and give it to the one who had the ten. For everyone who, will be, who has will be more given and he will have an abundance, but the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness in the place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many Christians attend church, do good deeds, and are going to be surprised that they do not have a relationship with God. When, when God calls them out, which we're going to see in this last, part, this last part as we wrap this thing up, some of us call ourselves Christians because we stand in a church but that would be like standing in a garage and calling yourself a car. It's not about your attendance. It's not about the things that you do. It's about your relationship with the king. Do you have one with this king? Do you understand that your identity is no longer your own? You owe Jesus a debt, a life debt. Think about Star Wars. Who is always at Han Solo's side? Chewbacca. He's always at his side. Have you ever wondered why? Well, if you watch the movies like I have, I'm a geek, I know. Chewbacca owed Han Solo a life debt. Han Solo saved his life. And Chewbacca and his culture would always be at Han Solo's side. Church, you owe Jesus a life debt. He died for you when you didn't deserve it. He died for me when I was his enemy. And what can I do while I wait expectantly for his return? I can live for him. I can leverage who I am to impact people who don't know him yet. My job, my home, my car are not mine. They're his and I, sh I should use them in a way to benefit those who don't know him yet, to encourage those that do. So let me ask you, how are you leveraging the things in your life? It doesn't matter if it's a broken down car. Guess who has a broken down car? Me. But it, I can still leverage it. I know some of us are like, well, I don't have any talent. My talent, I can read really fast. You compare to Robin, who has like 50 talents, I, sometimes you, you want to get jealous. It's like, oh, she can sing? Dang. She can dance? She can do spoken word. She does art? 
Like, come on now. Come on, God. I can read fast. Like, what do I do with that? But whatever your talent, you can leverage it for God. Because who gave it to you? God did. Who gave you that job? God did. Who gave you those kids? God did. What are you doing with the things that God has placed in your life, in your hands? Are you living for yourself? Let's find out what, if you do, what happens if you do. The last part, looking at 20, uh, 31 through 46. He, he tells this story that, of what will happen when he comes into his glory, when he is rightful, uh, rightfully placed as king. It says, when the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Who's sitting on that throne? Is it you or is it the king? If it's the king, then you live for him. Because before him will be gathered all the nations, all the people, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. There will be a time where the hypocrites are going to be exposed, where the people who live for themselves are going to be pushed off to the side. And that will be a scary day. It won't matter that you said, I was a member of the movement. I gave X number of dollars. I fed this guy week after week. It does not matter. If you don't know the king, then the king doesn't know you, which means you are separated eternally. Sheep, those that have leveraged their lives for Christ, the faithful, the loving, the obedient ones, they're the ones that are going to do things. Look at some of the things they did, starting at verse 34. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Watch the righteous sheep answer. Lord, when did we see you hungry or see you thirsty or see you naked? And listen to the king's reply. Truly I say to you, as you did to me, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. If you feed somebody who's hungry, Guess what you're leveraging? You're leveraging time. You're leveraging money. You might be leveraging your home. If you're giving somebody a drink, that's time and money. That's an effort on your part. They leveraged who they were in in Christ to make an impact. Look what happens to the goats. They have the same situation but they did not respond because they forgot that they are not owners of their lives, but only managers. He says to those on the left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And then they will also answer, "Uh, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked or, or... or thirsty? And the king answers, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Imagine what West Homestead would look like if we leveraged who we were in Christ to make an impact on this community. Individual action makes a collective impact. Individual action makes a collective impact. If I feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and you feed the hungry and clothe the naked because you're leveraging what God has placed in your life because you know that you are no longer your own, that you owe Jesus a life debt, the community changes. And they come into a a living and loving relationship with the king. John 13, 34, and 35 tells us that the the world will know us by our love. That's why we're the shirt. Love is our chicken, right? 
you should recognize it as Chick-fil-A writing. Have you been to Chick-fil-A lately? It is astounding what they can pull off. We were traveling somewhere and there were at least, I promise you, 50 cars wrapped around the building two times. Every single person knew their role, knew what they were responsible to do, and they did it with excellence. I, I, I kid you not, we were in the line expecting to be there for 30 minutes, and we were probably done in 15. Each person doing what they were trained to do, what they might maybe even had the talent and ability to do, and excellent service was given. Would it not be mind-blowing if the church was known for its love? Would it not change this community if the church was known for sacrifice instead of hypocrisy? Let me ask you, as I wrap this up, what are you leveraging for Christ? Take an inventory. There's going to be some, some questions to discuss in a moment. What are you leveraging for Jesus? You might sit there and say, well, I don't have much. That's a lie. Because you have your life, which means you have time. You have a, a voice to speak with. That means you can sit with someone and, and talk. Or even better, listen. There are things that you have that you've taken for granted, to be honest, and you have not leveraged it for him. The promise is clear. The reward is a relationship with the king. If you leverage who you are in Christ, the way that we're called to, you're, you get to spend time with the creator of the universe, the king of all. He's going to change you from the inside out because he gives you the Holy Spirit to walk with you through this process. And so if you don't know the king right now, it's very simple. You admit that you've been owner and not manager. You admit that you've been living for yourself and not for him. That's just called sin. And you confess it. You just say, God, I haven't trusted you. I've lived for myself. And you ask for forgiveness. God, I admit I have lived for me and not for you. And then in that moment, God comes to live inside of you. That you, you've just been justified. And now you begin this lifelong journey of leveraging who you are in Christ to make an impact around the world, around your world. And so if you have questions, you can put it in the, in the chat. If you are you know, needing to have conversations, reach out to somebody. Uh, movecc.org, you can ask your question there. But that's where it begins. We're responsible to grow. Grow in our relationship with God primarily and then grow in relationship with one another, leveraging who we are in Christ to change the world around us. Let's pray. God Almighty, thank you so much for this time. Uh, thank you for your truth. Help us to be the stewards that understand that we are managers and not owners. I pray for those, God, that may have put their trust in you even this morning, that they would reach out uh, to someone and ask questions, that they would look in your word, read for themselves what your truth says, that you love them, that you have a purpose and a plan for them, and that you want to change their lives from the inside out. Uh, for those of us that are believers, God, I pray that we would really take inventory of our lives and look at what it is that you've put in our life that we can start to leverage, if we haven't already, to impact uh, others, to give you the glory that you're due, but also to reach out and to love others. God, what, amazing, what an amazing story it would be if the movement was known for its love, just like Chick-fil-A is known for its chicken. We pray in your name. Amen. Have a great day. And we'll see you soon.